Hey everyone, it's Mark here. In this video, we're going to look at the weighted average cost of capital. Weighted average cost of capital is the discount rate that you would use when you discount back cash flows that arise to all stakeholders in the company. In this video, we'll go over how you'd calculate it and what it's used for. Now, I dig a bit deeper into it in one of my eBooks. I've included a link to that below. It's available for a couple of dollars from Amazon. But in this video, we'll look at how you go about calculating the weighted average cost of capital. So the weighted average cost of capital, as the name suggests, is going to be the weighted average of all of the costs of the firm's constituent sources of capital in proportion to their contribution to the firm's capital structure. That is, you take the cost of capital for each of the individual capital components, and then you get a weighted average of those costs. So for example, if the firm has 40% of its capital structure in debt, 60% in equity, then in the weighted average cost of capital, it's going to be 40% multiplied by the cost of debt and 60% multiplied by the cost of equity, where that cost of debt is denoted in after-tax terms. And we'll come to all of these concepts during the video. So let's focus first on the weightings. The weightings are important here because you're getting a weighted average of all of the costs of capital. Now, the weightings themselves need to be prospective looking. That is, they really need to reflect the firm's target capital structure. There's the capital structure that it realistically aims to be achieving. Now, this needs to be a realistic target as opposed to some pie in the sky target it might idealistically get a hold of. Also, it isn't historical. So it isn't simply the capital structure the firm had in the past. Now, it could be that the firm intends to maintain that capital structure, but in that case, you're really looking at what the intention is in the future. Related to this, you need to use market values. So for example, if you're getting the market value of equity, you need to use the firm's market capitalization. And they are going to use that market capitalization to calculate how much of the firm's total capital structure is coming from equity. Similarly, you do the same thing with debt, if at all possible. This is because these market values are prospective looking. Now, the next thing to bear in mind is if you're using the overall firm, then you would be looking at the overall firm's capital structure. But if you're valuing an individual project, it's possible that project itself might have a different risk level from the firm and might have a different capital structure from the firm. If it has a different risk level, you might need to adjust the weighted average cost of capital to reflect that riskiness. If that project can only sustain a much smaller amount of debt as well, then in that case, you might need to use a different weighted average cost of capital, reflecting that project's capital structure. The reason for that is if the firm can only if the firm can sustain much more debt than the project, then in that case, the project is probably much more risky, and therefore should probably have a higher weighted average cost of capital attributed to it. We can then move on to the sources of capital. So we've got debt and equity. The firm could also have preference shares, but the typical capital structure is going to be mainly comprised of debt and equity. So the cost of debt is the rate of return that lenders require in order for them to be willing to lend to the company. It's basically the yield to maturity on the firm's debt. Importantly, it isn't just the interest rate on historical debt, because that reflects what was required in the past. Now, for that yield to maturity, you could get that from reverse engineering from the, from the company's bonds or from, say, using a peer firm and looking at what the yield to maturity on similarly credit-rated companies is. That might be how you would get the cost of debt. Importantly here, you need to look at it on an after-tax basis. This is because debt is often tax-deductible. The interest on debt is often tax-deductible. This reduces the firm's taxable income, which itself can be a bit of a benefit for a company. As a result, you'd multiply the cost of debt that you obtain, so the yield to maturity, by one minus the tax rate, which would give you an after-tax cost of debt. We can then move on to the cost of equity. The cost of equity is the rate of return that equity holders require for them to be willing to buy shares in the company. So it, goes, it is going to reflect the riskiness of the company. Now, this cost of equity you would often get from the capital asset pricing model. Now, the capital asset pricing model is a topic in and of itself, but just in short, the basic way it works is it says the cost of equity is equal to the risk-free rate plus the firm's beta multiplied by a market risk premium. We can then unpackage these components. So the risk-free rate is the rate of return on, say, a risk-free government bond. The market risk premium is the additional premium that investors require for them to be willing to hold the risky market asset. The beta represents the sensitivity and responsiveness of the firm's returns to returns on that market index. So therefore, the capital asset pricing model says that the required return on equity is the risk-free rate plus beta multiplied by the market risk premium. Now, that's a typical way of getting the firm's cost of equity. Of course, it isn't necessarily the only way, but it is a typical way of doing that. So I hope this has given you an indication of how you calculate the firm's weighted average cost of capital, how you might go out and get the weights, how you get the cost of debt, how you get the cost of equity, and combine these together to get that weighted average cost of capital. 
Now, it's going to be used if you're looking at cash flows that arise to all stakeholders in the company. That is, that can be used to pay out to lenders and to equity holders. Importantly here, if you're just looking at equity cash flows, that is cash flows that arise after you've paid off the lenders, then in that case, you would use the cost of equity because these are cash flows that are purely attributable to equity holders. The weighted average cost of capital is used for cash flows that could be used to pay out to all of the stakeholders. So I hope this has given you some insight into how you calculate the weighted average cost of capital. As I indicated, I dig a bit deeper into this in my evaluation ebook. It's available for a couple of dollars from Amazon, so feel free to check that out. But I hope this video itself has been useful to you as well. So thanks so much for tuning in. I hope it's been helpful, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.